Friends Podcast. Hi, I'm Diane Hunt. I am an Impressionist Realist Painter connecting with nature through my brush. I work in oil paint and watercolor and I live in the countryside of Maryland's eastern shore, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. You can find me online at dianehuntstudio.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Diane Hunt Studio. Hi, I'm Constance Brosson of Steve Brosson's Jewelry Designs. I live in Oklahoma on a prairie and I make uh, handmade jewelry in silver, copper, and brass. I'm an artist that paints. I paint pastels and in oil sometimes. Hello, this is Clyde J.K. I'm the host of this podcast. I am a emerging representational artist. I do historic rend- renderings, seascapes, landscapes, volcanicals, birds, and whatnot. The tight illustrative hand in watercolor, identity, and acrylic paints. And I live in Oklahoma City. Well, hello, this is Clyde J. Kale, and once again, it is Monday for the Artist Friends Podcast, episode 84 for February the 15th, 2021, and I am coming to you from Frozen Tundra, Oklahoma. I read somewhere that it hasn't been this cold for over 100 years, so we are Freezing down here. I'm here with my two best artist friends, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. Hello, Diane. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Constance. Hello, everybody. How you doing, Constance? You staying warm? Yep. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Diane. Hello, everybody. Yeah, it's cold. I'm over in, in I'm in Oklahoma too. So, uh, it's definitely we got about eight inches of snow last night. I'm in the last, twenty-four the hours. Out on the prairie, but. She hasn't. It's cold. <laughs> blocking that wind coming across <laughs> across the ferry. At least I've got buildings and things blocking, you know, some of the wind here. But uh, yes, uh, I know Port Diane is really weeping for us up there in Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, today it was a little bit warmer, actually. Tomorrow's supposed to be in the fifties, <laughs> but wow. it's been cold, and it's supposed to be cold the rest of the week. It's supposed to be. Yeah, I now. think the storm is headed your way, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it did. I'm sure there's, from the looks of it, there's plenty of snow and ice left in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and then tomorrow night it, we're supposed to get another three to five inches here. Well, I'm so, this is very unusual. This is the first time I've been here for six years and I've been on this property for five, and this is the first year that it's snowed this much. The first year that I was here, it snowed, but and we didn't have any animals yet at that time, but this year it has been rough. Yeah, I, uh, I like I said, I was born and raised in Indiana, and one reason why I moved down here because I got tired of it being so cold and the snow and everything, and it's followed me. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, it won't stick around too long. <laughs> no, hopefully not. Yeah, I hope not. Uh, that was the thing up in Indiana. Once it snowed heavy. Uh, it stayed until almost summer. <laughs> it would stay. It would just stay on the ground forever. If you uh, if if you died during the winter time, you didn't get buried until the summer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> That's funny. It was so cold, they couldn't dig the ground. The ground, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can see that. 
that was just that's what they used to always say. Don't die during the winter time. <laughs> <laughs> I ordered some trees from this company, and they were supposed to be here Friday or Saturday, and they <laughs> still didn't come today. And I thought, well, they're going to have a hard time just getting getting up the driveway, much less <laughs> dropping off the trees. But uh, so yeah, and I can't plant them. We'll have to put them in the house and keep them warm until it comes time. At least the ground to thaw out so we can plant them because it's been a steady below zero uh, for the last two or three days. I think below freezing for almost a week now. Here in Oklahoma, it's not it's not supposed to uh, warm up until like near Friday. <clears throat> yeah, a whole lot, but at least it will. Yeah, up to the fifties. I think it's going thirties. Thirties. It's yeah. going to be up to thirties. Yeah, 30s. over thirty too. That would be nice. I think the chickens would appreciate it. <laughs> Six, negative seven. <laughs> what it's been. It's going to be a lot of people looking forward to summer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're sorry. This is not, this is not the artist. <laughs> but, uh, hey. After living in the Gulf for so long and then moving up here, uh, I was so hot for so long it took me forever to finally get cold you know because it was always i was always hot and so this year i'm cold <laughs> so, <laughs> which is unusual all right our our schedule for this week was uh, artist art history or artist biography and i was scratching my head who am i going to pick we've talked about quite a few so i decided uh, we're going to talk about Rembrandt, and if our listeners will go to www.talkartpodcast.com, that's talkartpodcast.com, you'll see the recommended video links. I found three excellent videos that talks about Rembrandt. As I say in the caption, uh, everything you want to know about Rembrandt, but was afraid to ask. <laughs> And they uh, they cover they they kind of some of the information overlaps, but uh, he was a really interesting artist. Um, Diane, I'll let you start off with the conversation. What is your impression, or what do you think about Rembrandt? Well, it, it's amazing that he was so successful so early in his life. That was like something that really stood out to me. But I mean, he had patrons and stuff when he was in his twenties, so. <laughs> He had, he had a lot of success really early, and, and unfortunately, he didn't um, watch his money too well, and he ended up dying in poverty. <laughs> yeah. But uh, That's what I didn't know. I mean, <clears throat> myself personally, I I never really cared that much for Rembrandt's art. Everybody goes, ooh, Google guy got over his art. I used to look at it because mostly he did what? some 80 some self portraits i mean he was doing self portraits all the time yeah. and i i just in his portraits of other people and i was never really i didn't really understand what was the big deal about rembrandt but then these videos kind of op- opened up my eyes a little bit of how you know his uh, with his brush strokes and 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 his uh, his coloring his usage, usage of paint and he was part of that that group of the during the the uh, 17th century when the Dutch became an economic power in Europe, you know, and, and uh, the Dutch Enlightenment period, I guess they call it. And um, he was uh, he was part of that, and he was you know the leader of that, which is why, like you said, in his 20s and 30s, he was already becoming worldwide world you know no especially throughout europe you know and, and um uh, but uh then things just went haywire when he got old he just and died in poverty you know constance what do you think about uh rembrandt i like his work um i like his use of color and his the flesh tones and the uh chiaroscuro paintings that uh he did and even after he decided to step away from portraits, you know, after his heyday with the portraits and he decided to do landscapes and all his landscapes are absolutely phenomenal. You know, it's just, 
and he did a lot of etching works, you know, uh, which were wonderful, you know, but, and he also taught, which, you know, a lot of, he taught a lot of artists back in that time period. Uh, and they were all, ended up being excellent artists from learning from him. Yeah. Uh, you know, becoming, uh, you know, exceptional. And he taught everything. Back then, they had to make their own paint and stretch their own canvas and do, you know, I mean, prepare the canvas. It's like you, so a lot of them did have people helping them. And they were teaching how to do all this stuff while while they were in their apprenticeship with them. You know, so um, you could spend more time painting and less time making making canvases and stuff point up because like on last week's uh podcast we talked about the you know the master student relationship and this kind of uh you know uh is a good example of i myself believe me if i had to make my own paint and stress my mm-hmm. own, i wouldn't be doing anything <laughs> you probably would but not as quickly <laughs> feel so fortunate that in the modern time all i gotta do is worried about picking the right colors and and de- deciding how much money i want to spend on the tube of paint <laughs> well you would just buy your your oils that you wanted to use and then buy the pigments and then you'd have to just make them you know put them out and do them yourself I mean, I, from the looks of it he just made what he needed to use at the time and use that, you know, rather than, of course, we're all sport. We just squeeze it out of the tube now. Grind the pigment in and then grind it, <laughs> you know, to go with it, which the filler usually was ground up human bones, you know, or, or, or marble, you know, and then adding the oil to that and then mix. It. Oh my God. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's an ordeal. I probably would have, I would have done that. <laughs> I would have. I, yeah. would have I mean, I've done that. it. I've done it with other other Egg type, types of arts, like you know, from the, like my fiber arts and stuff. I'm I've sheared goat, sheared the sheep, and took the wool and oh, got, cool. got natural dyes and did the whole you know really? the whole process all the way through. So I'm sure I would have done it with paint if I didn't have it available in tubes. <laughs> yeah, but. But I mean, he had all those. He had so many people um, that he was uh, mentoring, and that were working in his studio. That were doing a lot of a lot of work, and there's a lot of paintings that they found more recently. Doing mm-hmm. all the research that they thought were his, and they weren't. <laughs> they were their his students' work, and but he had they had he had students working in his in his uh, shop in the studio, and. They were painting, and then he was signing the paintings. So, any work that they did under him, he was yeah, he was he was quite a businessman, really. I mean, um, you know, he did a lot of um, that kind of stuff. And at the time, that was pretty um, advanced. Like it wasn't something that was normally done at that time period. That's like in the the third video when the title of you know the the real uh, Rembrandt. Uh, The emphasis of that video was they found. Over the years, so many paintings that had been attributed to Rembrandt, they weren't. And after further analysis, and discovery, yeah, and it was so, I found interesting was uh, how uh, they even uh, dissected his signature, how he, you know, uh, drew his R and, and, and you know, and, and uh, signed his paintings, how they could identify what was a real Rembrandt and what wasn't from that. And that, that there's so many paintings, lots of paintings in their major galleries that uh, you're thinking they have a Rembrandt. And they, they don't. They have something probably done, like you said, Diane, by one of his students, mm-hmm. one of his assistants, you know, that, uh, 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 and that knew how to paint like him because they worked by, mm-hmm. close by, you know. I mean, just because it's a painting that's, that's from the same period doesn't necessarily mean it's, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, an original Rembrandt. Yeah, but some of them are really close. They're, you know, they are hard to tell, and until mm-hmm. they really start picking them apart, it was hard for them to find that. I mean, now we have more technology to be able to see all those things, but that's why a lot of I, it, 
the x-ray technology yeah. and that film they talk you know in that video they talked about the you know the x-ray and and they could see on you know there was some thinking that you know rembrandt had already uh uh had already worked out the placement of his figures and the placement of articles in the paintings and they showed through the x-ray that he frequently did it he changed his mind right through the painting and you know how an arm would be stretched in one way and then they would show the underpainting where it was actually the original position was of a different angle and and I, I found it to be interesting, you know, how they, uh, he kind of changed his mind as he, as he was working, you know, working on the piece for our non artist listeners are probably saying, Oh, big deal. But <laughs> yeah, for artists, this is, this is interesting. This is, you know, we have a certain conceptions about, you know, these masters and, uh, Constance, when you mentioned the, the Kira squirrel, uh, they suspect he picked up that technique from Caravaggio because he was uh-huh. in Italy in the Naples area where Caravaggio was working at the same time. And they, they don't have any direct evidence, but uh, he, uh, when he went back to uh, 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 the Netherlands, all of a sudden he, he, he started painting in that Cure Squirrel and he introduced the Cure Squirrel technique to the northern, you know, northern Europe, because that's a that came about because that was a southern Europe technique, predominantly. Um, well, they said that as he made money, he bought he bought volumes of prints and etchings to to use as subject matter, and bought lots of um, artifacts and things to put into his paintings. You know, so yeah. and if you're still a painter, you know, you need things around to paint you know so that was a sad part of the story he had this big house this big house that he and he had it full of all these artifacts and and paintings and prints of other artists and then when he went bankrupt he had to sell off most of that stuff yeah and they said they explained that's that's how uh, his uh, how come his paintings are so widespread throughout the world? Because at the time when he was going broke, so yeah. buying his stuff, you know, and that lived over in Spain and France and up in England, and I mean, even in the United States, there's Rembrandt's in the United States where you know people brought, bought them and take took them to the at that time what was considered the New World, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it's. It's sad. Such a great painter, such a brilliant talent, and he, you know, died. Well, it happens. <laughs> he died in poverty. You know, it's, I guess that's part of being. What do you call it? Right brained or left brained? <laughs> you're not great at managing money, but you're great at other things. You know, artistic things. You know, it's kind of hard to such a, such a debtor's prison. You know that uh, if you owed money and you couldn't pay it. He went to jail. So, <laughs> well, it's not like he blew it on nothing. I mean, he had the items to sell to pay for, you know, the, to sell out in order to get out of hog. But yeah, but he just, yeah, he but just had some to... tragedies happen through it. You know, yeah. His wife yeah. died and his kids died, and you know, it all kind of culminated. And, and then his nurse kind then of later took on the wind out of his sails, I guess, kind of. Yeah, uh, that's enough to send anybody into a sort mm-hmm. of a depression. And when you lose a child and then you lose a wife and then you lose you know i think even the nurse nursemaid that he had gotten for his son uh she ended up dying before he did so i mean life can be hard on you sometimes yeah life (laughs) takes its soul sometimes that's for sure yep and uh he was you know uh he he certainly yeah had a near the end of his life was certain a lot, a lot of tragedy, you know, the ter- you know, terrible things. That's, uh, but it, what was interesting was unlike other artists that we've talked about, he didn't bring it on himself. It just happened. I mean, uh-huh. he, he wasn't as good at managing money. In fact, didn't he have even some people who were supposed to be handling his affairs that kind of ripped them off? Wasn't there some of that, you know, uh-huh. 
I don't remember that part. Um, I, think I do know that he had one of the two videos. They talked about that. He had like a manager or something who's supposed to be handling his finances and they kind of ran away with some of his money, you know? And so, uh, you know, he, he concentrated on his art, but he didn't pay attention to the other. So well, that's a lesson for us as artists. Um, you know, as we progress in this career, and we have to depend on others, but we also got to keep an eye, you know, one eye close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I haven't had much of that problem yet, but it would be nice. <laughs> oh. I don't, I wouldn't want to get ripped off by somebody, but it does happen. People get ripped off a lot, you know, so you know, other, that's just not in the art field either. And like, you know, Jackson Pollock and, and Andy Warhol and, you know, other artists that we've talked about, uh, even Van Gogh, you know, they, they've kind of, uh, contributed to their downfall, you know, by rambocious and lifestyle, and, you know, purposely, uh, you know, doing things to, uh, you know, just destroy their life. And, uh, Rembrandt was, because he was a bit of a, uh, he was a uh, very religious, you know, his, uh, which is why his paintings are, uh, uh, so uh, uh, brilliant, and uh, he, uh, Stephen Bauman has talked about this before, that uh, instead of uh, having a painting that was uh, direct, you know, that you could see as a direct religious painting, his paintings were very subtle in the way he used light, you know, and how he represented at the time, you know, that the, the use of gold, golden light in the skin was... Uh, of a, uh, had a, a, that was the, you know, the re reflection of God, the father, you know, that, uh, well, his portraits too. He, he really liked, um, showing people the way they really were and not making pretty pictures or, you know, trying to <laughs> make them prettier than they were or whatever. He, he showed people how they really were and the, um, uh, different features like your different expressions and stuff that other p artists before that really didn't show much of that right so he was kind of an innovator as far as that goes and, and i think and, he, and he was doing all that at such a young age and i think that's really what set him off like on this this path where he was so well known because it came from a young artist that um he really didn't have his family was fairly wealthy, but they weren't like aristocratic type people. His right. father was a mill worker or had a mill. So he, he came from sort of a, the underdog kind of background, you know, he wasn't raised in the. Yeah. And he married well, you know, but he just, mm -hmm. uh, I wrote down two of the things that, that they, he said that portraits must, there's like portraits, portraits must. And it's one of them is, is show the sitter's personality and status, physical likeness, and making the sitters happy with their identity. You know, so that was two of the things that said that he liked he liked to do with his portraits, and he did do those things. You know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, like I said, I I never really cared that much for Rembrandt, but maybe it's because I didn't really understand. But after watching these videos, I've got a new a new profound uh, respect, you know, for yeah. technique. And the fact that he did, he was, he was the, probably the only artist that did the most self portraits, you know, all artists do it. Like eventually I'm going to have to do a self portrait, you know, of, of myself I'm scared to death. <laughs> <laughs> I've done, I've done three of them of myself. And I need to do another one since I've gotten older. I haven't done one since, since I was in my forties. The last time I did a self-portrait of myself, I was 17 years old, and <laughs> it's been lost. I don't know where it is. It's been lost in the history, you know, but uh, it, uh, my mother said it looked like me, but I didn't think it looked like me, so, <laughs> but eventually, my daughter even asked me that. So, when are you going to do I, Yeah, I, I think that we see ourselves a lot differently than other people see us. Yeah. You know, and I think, and a lot of times when you do somebody's portrait, when they first look at it, they don't identify with it right away because they don't see themselves exactly how you see them, you know, so it takes them a little time to warm up sometimes. I did one person 
I did her portrait one time. It was pastel portrait. And she said, do I look like that? And I said, (laughs) (laughs) you know, she said, oh, okay. (laughs) You know, so, yeah. People to uh, develop that skill because every time I, I attempt to, when I do a drawing or whatever, yeah, I have no problem drawing a human face and the human body, but it don't look like the person it's supposed to look like. I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not seeing what I should be seeing, you know? So, uh, that's it takes a- practice. I mean, you have to practice at it, uh, in order to get it. I, I took portrait lessons from a lady in Talladega, Alabama for a, at least a year. And she really helped me learn a lot about portrait painting, but you know, that's been a long time ago. So but, that's probably one of the reasons I haven't attempted another portrait of myself. <laughs> many self-portraits of himself but so as he aged you know you look at you look at him and you can see as he's getting older you know and 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 the, his uh you know that's what was so interesting he wasn't afraid to to show himself as he as he got older you know with the, mm-hmm. with the bulbous nose and you know and the, <laughs> yeah he the one of his techniques were that he didn't make a lot of the portrait painters made the the canvas of the the face with a smooth finish rather than having a rough texture of a finish for the portrait you know he didn't and you could if you look at closely at his paintings you can see that they aren't that where the people just kind of go over them and over and over them again trying to make them look translucent and but he gets the color and the texture so spot on with just as loose a work as he does do with bold, you know, bold brushstrokes. That's what Mm -hmm. amazed me. And, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to the artist friends podcast episode 84 for February the 15th, 2021. And I've been here with talking with Diane hunt and Constance Bronson. And we've been talking about Rembrandt. I hope that you find, you find these podcasts of interest. We don't bore you too much. And I think we're going to call close this one, one of our shorter ones. We've been doing long ones for a while, but uh, this is one of our shorter ones. And I think it's because it's so cold. Maybe that's uh, contributing to the uh, <laughs> being short. I've got to go and uh, drink me some warm beverage and hot coffee because I'm sitting here shivering almost. <laughs> <laughs> Even though my furnace has been coming on two or three times, but it's still, there's a cold draft coming at me, you know, so. We got to drink some uh, some hot coffee, hot tea, some hot tea to uh, warm myself up. Put some long woolies on your feet. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say bye to Diane and Constance, and I'll let Diane say bye to everybody. Good night, Clyde. Good night, Constance. Good night, everyone. Stay warm. Good night, Clyde. Good night, Diane. Good night, everybody. Thanks for listening, and stay warm. <laughs> And and yes, the same sympathy. Stay warm, please. Take care of yourselves out there. And as always, give us some love. Give us some, however you hear these podcasts. Give us a star rating, some thumbs up, or send us comments. Let us know what you think. Until next time, good night, folks. The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde J. Kale. Participating artists, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson and Clyde J. Kale. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Constance Bronson at www.edsy.com forward slash shop forward slash c-b-r-o-s-n-a-n-s Clyde J. Kale at www.cjkaleartworks.com If you would like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends Podcast please email cjkale at sign mystery-otr.com If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a thumbs up or star rating. And most of all, send us your comments.
This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons license.